name is Taylor Moreland. I'm the owner of Acro Spray Drones, and we are the currently largest uh, distributor of um, uh, spray drones here in the U.S. And we have partnered with Steve Lee, um, who is going to be presenting today a lot of his research, a lot of his data. Um, whenever we met Steve, you know, we realized that he was probably as much, if not more, obsessed with spray drones than we were. Um, and the great thing is, is he has, you know, a really good team there at Auburn um, that he works with um, and that he, you know, he's driven, uh, passionate about agriculture, um, you know, passionate about helping farmers in his area. Um, so it seemed like a really good fit to work with him. You know, that's kind of where, how we, we approach this technology, um, sprayer drones. Whenever I started this business, it wasn't because I thought the technology was cool. It was because, you know, we really had a need, a fit, uh, a problem, if you will, um, an aerial application, at least here in the Midwest. You know, we're based in Missouri. And fungicide in the Midwest was always a problem um, as far as timeliness application. And so we were looking for a solution and spray drones were that solution. So we approached this from an ag perspective, um, from an agronomy perspective. Um, you know, from a farmer first perspective. And so that's how we, we do business. And that's how Steve does his research. So it's uh, really a, a match made in heaven. Um, so a bit about us, uh, we were founded in um, 2020, did a year worth of testing. And uh, we started with the, the Agris T20 um, there in 2021, um, as far as, um, you know, sales to our customers. Uh, the Agris T30 moved into that uh, this past year. Um, and then the T40 here, uh, which uh, Steve might be sharing a bit on the on the T30 and the T40 um, today, um, because that's kind of like the next generation of spray drones. Um, so whenever we we approach spray drones, we really looked for what is the best technology that it exists, what is the easiest to use software that exists. We found that you know right now we're with DJI, and DJI does have very good technology, very good software, very user friendly. Um, on the back side, though, we also know that it's not just about the technology. You know, there is a ton of other stuff that has to um, accompany spray drones when you look at them as a solution. So when you look at getting into this industry, you have to first, yes, obviously get the drones, uh, but also get all other supporting equipment that you're going to need. Um, so how do you run the drone out in the field? Then you have to look at licensing, um, FAA. I mean, there's a ton of licensing here. On that, that needs to be done. Um, and then you have to look at insurance um, and you have to look at, um, you know, what you're going to be doing with the drone on the agronomy side. How does it work with different products? And so that's what we try to do is provide, you know, everything around that, not just the equipment, but the licensing, the, you know, the insurance resources, the agronomy resources, resources and of course, they support as well, um, since these are very different from whatever anybody else has um, operated in the past, uh, support is, is huge. Um, and so that's why we're working with Steve on the agronomy side, so that hopefully we can get a lot better answers uh, for our customers, for our potential customers, um, as far as what these drones can do and, and how to use them. Um, we're working right now, of course, the T40 um, is kind of like the, the next new thing that's it's out right now that has big interest. Um, we're also um, going to be starting some research with multispectral uh, using the Mavic 3 multispectral, which should be launching here very soon, which will be an extremely affordable and honestly uh, a really good multispectral um, you know, sensor on a drone. Uh, so looking forward to that, too. And then there'll, there'll be a few new uh, new products when it comes to autonomy. You know, that's kind of what we're looking at is, is autonomy um, and site specific um, management um, in agriculture. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and let Steve take this over. He's got a ton of information for you guys. And the reason you guys are here uh, is, is because of him. So uh, first off, thank you, Steve, uh, for allowing us to work with you. And I'll let you take it away. All right, thanks, Taylor. I appreciate all your uh, kind words. And uh, very happy to be here uh, to share the information we generated last summer. Uh, again, real quick introduction. Um, Steve Lee, I'm the Extension Specialist and Associate Professor in College of Agriculture of Auburn University. Uh, my extension responsibility and my specialty is in uh, weed science uh, or herbicides, 
but also I spent a lot of time spraying all different kinds of chemicals in general. Uh, so have a fairly good knowledge and a background in pesticide application and uh, efficacy evaluation uh, as well. So we started to play with uh, agriculture drones since about three years ago, maybe around 2020, uh, and then uh, slowly getting into the uh, spray drone business. So the first one we got was a multispectral, and then we have several RGB drones as well. Um, so uh, as we do more and more drone related research, uh, I feel like this is probably the way to go in the future, because uh, just spraying different chemicals with backpack can be uh, pretty boring in the middle of the summer when you realize you have several thousand plus you have to spray uh, that kind of thing. So uh, we need to look for some new things to keep ourselves ent entertained and motivated. So that's why we got into the spray drone business in the first place. And then we realized a lot of the uh, spray drones uh, have very good potential. They can be used on multiple crops. So start to get real excited about it and start to heavily testing uh, spray drones since um, the end of last year and, and concentrated on uh, different spray drones this year as well. So in this presentation, I will share uh, a few uh, successful examples and some of our data uh, generated from those projects. So I will cover the uh, spray pattern, uh, can it be penetration evaluation first? And then I'll talk about a few pesticide efficacy trials we did on farm. I'll talk about uh, field mapping and the spa spraying as well, but it's gonna be very brief uh, because this is a very fast developing area. Uh, but I am very excited about the new multispectral uh, from uh, DJI, the Mavic 3 multispectral. Uh, like Taylor said, it's almost dirt cheap and the uh, specification look really good on paper. Uh, so far, we don't have any actual demo or testing unit yet, but I really look forward to um, uh, flying it and uh, trying it out uh, in the field. Uh, at the end, I'll talk about uh, current challenges a little bit and then open up for a Q&A for anybody who have questions. So first of all, I want to throw out these questions. And uh, it's possible that after this presentation, you may feel more confused than the uh, than the knowledge you learn from the presentation. You know, you may get more questions than the answer uh, you learn from from today. But but that's fine. You know, it's always good to trigger some new thoughts and do brainstorming. Um, so, for people that never use spray drone before, uh, usually they will ask me, "How wide does this thing spray, or or spray or swath with?" I throw out two pictures here. You know, I just download the pictures from the internet. Everybody have used uh, a ground sprayer uh, and also know how ground sprayer work fairly well if you're in, if you are in the farming business. You know, to quantify the, the swath width of this ground sprayer, you know, that's not difficult at all. Basically, you just measure the length of your boom and that's how wide you can spray in one pass, right? There's nothing fancy about it. But how do you quantify the swath width of your spray drone? And that become interesting because I hate to tell people this, swath width is a variable. It's not determined as a John Deere boom sprayer. You know, this could be 100 feet, 120 feet. How wide a spray drone actually can spray is dependent on several factors. The most important factor that determine your swath width is how high you fly. And this is not difficult to understand. If I fly this spray drone only three feet above the ground, it's not gonna cover 20 feet width, you know? But if I fly the thing really, really high, say 30 feet in the air, it can potentially cover wider swath. But the trade-off is, your spray pattern will be very weak. And if there's a crosswind going uh, through the field at that time, you may not have a swath or, or a spray pattern at all because the wind is just gonna blow everything away, all right? 
So swap swap width is the first thing we need to figure out before we actually use spray drone to spray any type of pesticide or chemicals. And also the second question I throw out here is, do you think spray drone is more of a drone or is more of a sprayer? This depends on how you look at it. I have to say as extension specialist, I talk to people all the time. Um, every year could be several hundred or maybe several thousand people. Um, I, don't, I don't keep track of that kind of stuff. But a lot of people ask me questions and especially these days when people hear I work on spray drones, and, you know, I literally get questions from all the way from South Dakota down to Florida and occasionally a few Canadian operators ask me questions. And this uh, this morning, one guy from Mexico or, uh, asked question. You know, he can't even write English. He typed in Spanish and, and uh, you know, Facebook would translate what he wrote into English. That's how I can understand. So a lot of those people ask me questions have pilot license. They might be a retired pilot from military, you know, for example. They don't have any agriculture background, but they, they just think with my pilot license, flying drone should be easy, all right? Then I want to get into this spray drone business. I want to be able to do custom application from there, from that point, just because I have, I have been flying aircraft for so many years. I, this should be easy. Actually, most of those people holding this type of mentality hit the wall pretty quickly. This is why I throw out this question first. Are we talking about a drone or are we talking about a sprayer? Because if you have zero knowledge in how to manage a sprayer, in how to spray pesticide, it's going to be very hard for you to succeed just by knowing how to fly an aircraft because we're not flying aircraft here. We're flying a sprayer in the sky. So this is a sprayer that can fly, in my opinion, but it's not just a drone. You know, if you want to have fun flying as a drone, sure, all day long, you know, but you cannot make money off having fun with flying a drone commercially because the end product, the outcome is to spray a pesticide or chemical uniformly and assure the efficacy so you can get paid at the end of the day. If your efficacy sucks, you're not gonna get paid really well or for very long. You're gonna basically just you know, run your, your business to, to the dead end um, because it's not gonna be a continuous business if you cannot ensure the efficacy. All right, that's some questions I will throw out at the start of the uh, presentation. And then when we first got our spray drone, we did the same thing which, have, which we have done many times in the past, you know, spray testing. And then we didn't know how to spray. We know nothing about it and couldn't find any useful information on the internet, which was great, all right? So we just start testing blindly and didn't know what parameters to use. And then as a result, we saw a lot of these, right? You can have one picture dish as a receptor on the ground showing really good coverage. This one could be three feet away from it, have literally less than half of the coverage or the droplet hits. So it's a super, you know, super <laughs> disappointing. It's not very uniform at all, you, you know? So after trying this for a little while, we start to do better. Um, but again, this is a good reminder for those folks just getting into the spray drone business. Don't think it's gonna work good for you automatically because that first couple of try, you're gonna fail. Our first spraying of the actual chemical didn't work at all, you know. Um, so it's gonna take some failure before you can harvest success. You know? uh, again, that's why I say pattern testing, uniformity testing, swap width testing. That's why they're important because if you don't figure out this stuff out, you don't get your parameter optimized. You're not gonna get very good results. Uh, I think Taylor shared a story with me, Taylor and Alex. Uh, uh, one guy got spray drone T30. First thing he sprayed was cotton defoliants. You know, you have to defoliate the cotton before you can pick. He doesn't know anything about spray drone. He didn't talk to nobody. Basically, just think this thing is going to work magically. And then he flew 28 feet swath width using a T30. His altitude was way too low, only eight feet above the ground. And guess what? After he sprayed the defoliants, 
he has this nice green streaks of cotton and they were all eight feet wide every 28 feet all right that's the spot that he missed in between his passes this is why we have to emphasize on the swath with and also on the uniformity testing because you have to play with this a little bit to know better all right, with the newer drones, particularly with a rotary atomizer or the spinning disc or centrifuge disc, however you call them, I think the uniformity start to look better compared to the flat fan nozzles. Uh, that's something to be excited about. And also with all the flat fan nozzles, they get clogged. They get clogged all the time. All right, T30 does not have a strainer, you know, like the, uh, the mesh screen to filter out the impurity. So in return, the, orf the orifice get clogged fairly easily. We spend a lot of time using knives or thin wires to clean the orifice in the field just because they get clogged fairly, uh, 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 you know, fairly frequently. Versus the rotary atomizer, you know, they don't have orifice no more. So it's going to take a lot of impurity to clog one of those things up, right? Uh, and also a spray much wider swath compared to the uh, flat fan nozzles. That's something I'm excited about. All right, looking at some stuff that you guys have interest. You know, whenever we talk about efficacy in extension meeting, everybody start to get excited. All right, uh, like I said, my specialty is in herbicides. That's uh, that's uh, what I did in grad school, and that's what I still do for uh, for extension in Alabama. So I'm gonna uh, flex my muscle in the uh, herbicide uh, um, uh, world a little bit in this presentation. So you can see some efficacy work we did with different herbicides. So in this test, which is on farm, we were trying to kill really thick cover crop. We have rye, clover, and radish, three-way mix. Um, so we call it NRCS mix, because if you want to go after NRCS incentive, you gotta plan this mix. To terminate radish and a clover, it's not very easy. You're gonna have to give Roundup PowerMax or Roundup some help, whether this is 2,4-D or Reviton or, or whatever. We use Liberty in this test. Liberty doesn't have an area application label, but it does work really well with spray drone. Uh, I actually had a meeting with BASF earlier this year to potentially expand the Liberty label to cover every application. Hopefully that's gonna happen one day so we can use Liberty legally with a spray drone and airplane, particularly with spray drone, just because of the downdraft. All right, I'm gonna come back to this point about Liberty um, uh, efficacy later in the talk. But over here, let's focus on Reviton and Roundup. Reviton is a new PPO herbicide in the same family of Valor and Sharpen. Many of y'all spray Sharpen because they kill mare's tail or horseweed really good. Valor is a big thing down here in cotton peanut rotation because it's great on pigweed uh, still. You know, we don't have a whole lot of PPO resistant pigweed, so they still work good. Roundup and the Reviton did a fairly good job to kill the waist high tillage radish in this treatment. But with 1% methylated seed oil, you can see the uh, blue and the purple color gets darker. All right, in this graph, which is uh, made by multispectral drone, red indicates very healthy, very green biomass. Blue indicates dead yellow biomass or just dirt, right? So the bluer it gets, which, you know, that means the, the deader, the more dead uh, the vegetation uh, was on the ground. As you can see, 1% methylated seed oil made a difference compared to without. And also one thing we realized is there were a lot of streaks of green. The, the, all of these red streaks are actually green streaks in the field, all right? Because red indicates higher green biomass or higher um, uh, alive cover crop biomass here. So we saw streaking pretty good with Liberty and almost all of these treatments, but this 1% of methylated seed oil reduces streaking as well. So my talking point here is make sure you use the best chemical and the best adjuvants to enhance your efficacy particularly when you spray contact herbicide or defoliants, because you will have some of the problem at some point, especially when you stretch your swath with really, really wide. At the edge of your swath, 
you don't get much propeller downdraft to push your droplets in. So it's gonna be hard to kill that stuff at the edge. Chemical selection is important. Reviton did a much better job compared to 24D to kill the radish. All right, so that's something to keep in mind. You want to have spray drone, but they also want to ensure you use the best chemical available to uh, enhance the efficacy. Again, morning glory on corn is a big deal. A lot of time when you get too much of that stuff, you can't harvest or combine your corn because you're going to drag corn down on the ground. You know, when they're on the ground, you can't harvest them. Power Max by itself uh, was not enough to kill really, really thick morning glory. Gromoxone by itself, it was even worse. You know, uh, we spray a lot of gromoxone in cotton peanut rotation. We know this from a long time ago that gromoxone is not a good product on morning glory. You need to tank mix 2,4-DB or bentazone to increase the um, efficacy on uh, morning glory. However, if you put a one ounce or one and a half ounce of AIM, which is similar as Valor and Sharpen and Reviton, you know, PPO herbicide, it does a really good job on morning glory. I'm going to go back to this point a little bit later in the talk, but make sure you pick the good chemical and tank mix to start with. Again, timing is very important. You know, if you miss the timing, it don't matter what you spray. It don't matter how fancy your sprayer is. You're not going to control the pest. That's just, you know, chemical application 101. All right. In this case, I sprayed Saline Max at a really high rate on some goosegrass and crabgrass. This was way too late. I think I sprayed August the 1st when the crabgrass and goosegrass were knee high, sea heads were fully emerged. And guess what? Where I sprayed with a drone versus where I didn't spray as a non treaty check, you don't tell much difference because that stuff was just too old. You know, as a weed scientist, we tell people you have to spray when the weeds are three inches tall, and that's my three inches tall. But, you know, for some of my growers, the definition for their three inches tall is probably this big. All right. So our three inches come a little bit different depends on who you talk to. All right. If this is your three inches tall, you're never going to have really good efficacy because you're always several weeks behind the ball game. All right. Try to do things on time. And this is very important. And also, this is why spray drones are popular, because when it's too wet, no grow, no ground sprayer can get into the field. You can still spray over the top. You know, when everybody has to be off their timing because it's too wet, you can still be on time, which is awesome. All right, in this test, we saw a lot of streaking. Again, this is a three-way cover crop mix termination. We saw a lot of streaking here and there, um, you know, very thick cover crop. Uh, chemical we apply was Roundup and Reviton with methylated acetyl at a two gallon per acre and 10 feet off the ground. We killed the rye really good in this test, but we didn't kill the clover and reddish good. You can see the green streak that I was talking about very well in this picture. This is one green streak. This is another streak right there. If you look into the grain streak or it's strip where I didn't kill really well, rye, silver rye was still plenty dead. All right, Roundup don't really care about streaking because it's systemic herbicide. It translocates really, really well uh, in, the, uh, in the plant. So take home message, when you spray systemic herbicide, you know, streaking won't be too bad. I'm not saying it won't happen, but it won't be as bad as contact herbicide. Reviton is a PPO contact herbicide. If Reviton doesn't hit the leaf of the clover, it's not going to kill it. That's why when streaking shows up, it's always where Reviton doesn't get to the leaf and kill the plant. That's where we see streaking, all right? So make sure when you spray contact pesticides, you have to reduce your swaths a little bit and make sure you got a really good canopy penetration because if you don't touch the pest, you don't touch the leaves, of those weeds, you're not gonna kill them. All right, in this test, we compared airplane versus spray drone for canopy penetration and the coverage to simulate the fungicide sprayed at the tassel stage. This is the number one usage of spray drone in the country, particularly in the Midwest, because you guys have way too many corn acreage compared to what we have down here in the Southeast. You know, our acreage of corn is negligible compared to 
Nebraska and Iowa. All right, so in this test, we sprayed uh, with airplane and spray drone in the same field. And then uh, it was done basically side by side in the same field, in the same day. And then after we spray, we were spraying water with a little bit of fluorescence dye. As you can see, this is why the water looks pink. You know, after we spray the test, we went into each treatment block, harvest the corn leaves, you know, we harvested two leaves per plant and we harvested, we harvested 75 plants in three reps, three transects per treatment block. We immediately washed fluorescence dye off those uh, corn leaves and then we stored them. Uh, we took them back to the lab, centrifuge everything and then analyze it with this machine so we can tell the concentration of spray dye at one parts per billion level, which is very, very low. This is an interesting picture. If you look at these little vials, all right, each vial represents the concentration of the dye from one leaf. So each, each vial is the sample from each leaf. You can tell the variation of the dye on the corn leaves from this one block, all right? Theoretically speaking, we want to see all the color to be the same across all these little two mil vials, but in reality, that never happens. So this means you're just gonna have to live with a lot of variation uh, uh, of the um, uh, coverage on the actual corn ear leaf, you know. So first of all, we put two DRAs in two different treatment blocks compared to the third block where we had no DRA. All right, this gray color bar uh, represents the uh, concentration of dye on upper leaf. And then the blue color bar represents the um, dye concentration, the spray dye concentration on the ear leaf. The higher, the better, all right? So without a DRA, we saw the highest dye concentration on the upper leaf. However, the concentration of spray dye on the ear leaf was much lower, was much lower. You know, a little bit over half, but you know, not by much. So this means without a drift reducing agent, you will leave a lot of your fungicide product on top of the leaf, on top of the canopy, which is not great because we want to protect the ear leaf. We want to push the fungicide which is expensive, which is expensive into the canopy so we can protect the ear leaf and keep those fungus out. With DRA, things become interesting. Let's take example as this DRA2. We saw a significant reduction of the dye concentration on the upper leaf, which is two leaf above the ear leaf. So we saw a significant statistical significant reduction here. Uh, with upper leaf. On the year leaf, it was not statistically different, which is a shame, but we saw a trend of increased dye concentration in this block where we used the dye, oh, well, sorry, where we used the, the DRA. So next year, we want to continue this study and we want to use T40, which has stronger propeller downdraft, propeller wash, possibly can push the dye deeper into the canopy. So hopefully with using higher rate of DRA and a more powerful drone, more powerful downdraft, we can increase this bar, the height of this bar to about this level. So this difference will be statistically different. So that's my goal. And uh, that means we're able to push more, more fungicide product into the canopy and protect our ear leaf against tar spot, you know, southern corn rust and all, those kind of stuff. Many operators want to know how does the uniformity of drone applications compare to airplane and a ground sprayer, which are traditionally traditional methods. Uh, based on what we have seen, the coefficient of variation are very similar to airplane and a ground sprayer. Uh, a ground sprayer may can create a little bit more uniform uh, spray uh, uh, coverage, 
uh, across the swath, which is not surprising because the ground sprayer in this test spray 12 or uh, 15 gallon per acre. Drone and airplane only spray two gallon per acre. So when you have seven and a half times more water as a volume, as a carrier, um, yeah, you can get a little bit more uniform um, uh, concentration on the leaves. And particularly there are, there are nozzles mounted on a boom, you know, at equal distance. So it's gonna be hard to beat to the ground sprayer. But for airplane and the drones, I think they are pretty much comparable, you know. All right, what about the uh, spray dye concentration? <clears throat> uh, my bad. I think I highly do the wrong thing here. <clears throat> there we go. All right, what about the spray dye concentration on the corn ear leaf and upper leaf? You know, let's just focus on the ear leaf which are represents by the uh, red bars. We did not see any statistically significant difference uh, between the treatments, all right? Which means however you want to use the drone, um, you know, in this study, uh, it did not create any significant difference compared to the airplane and the ground sprayer. All the dye concentration on the corn ear leaf were equal, all right? So, sorry, I, I don't have, and the news that you want to hear that spray drone is actually better than airplane, so you can beat the crop duster in your county by telling folks that oh, spray drone actually actually work better than airplane. But at least I can tell you we're not losing this game, uh, um, you know, against the uh, airplane because the dye concentration on the ear leaf was the same between the spray drone and airplane. For ground sprayer, it's also the same uh, in this test. At the other location. We don't have the airplane in Talladega County. Um, you know, there are plenty of counties in Alabama don't have crop duster service. That's why I say this, this is the golden opportunity for the drone operators down in our neck of the woods because we don't have enough acreage compared to Iowa or Missouri. You know, so a lot of time if people want to spray over the top of the crop for, for every application it has to be drone, you know, some more opportunity here. For a ground sprayer at a Talladega County site, Actually, we recorded a significant difference here, you know, uh, versus the drone. So drone was able to, T30 was able to push more spray dye onto the ear leaf compared to a large John Deere sprayer with 1,200 gallon tank and a 2,000 uh, and, uh, and uh, 120 foot boom. So this difference was significantly better, uh, you know, um, compared to the ground sprayer, which is awesome. All right, what about the crop response? Uh, when you mix chemical at two gallon per acre versus 15, your chemical concentration is seven and a half times higher, all right? Does that mean you're gonna burn a crop worse? Or does that mean that crop will not respond as much as 15 gallon per acre because your coverage is also less, all right? So we ran this test on soybean. We sprayed a Roundup Power Max with Zedra or a Roundup Power Max with Zedra with Reflex as a three way mix. So we either spray the two way mix or the three way mix by drone or by ground sprayer. Mm -hmm. We only tested two gallon per acre with drone, but we tested five, 10, and 15 gallon per acre with the ground sprayer. Three days after the Roundup Power Max and the Zedra and the Reflex tank mix treatment, two gallon per acre by drone, we saw a little bit of leaf speckling, but not too much. Leaf burn was totally acceptable. It don't look bad at all. Because you guys know how it looks after you spray Reflex uh, or a prefix over the top of beans. It's not gonna look pretty for the first couple of days. All right, with your ground sprayer at a 10 gallon per acre, the exact same chemical mix, exact same rate per acre, damage was significantly higher just because you have better coverage. And this is these are contact herbicides. All right, we're talking about you burn the leaf worse with this treatment, 10 gallon per acre by sprayer. All right, next treatment, 15 gallon per acre by ground sprayer. I say it's kind of comparable to the 10 gallon per acre by ground sprayer. Both were way worse than two gallon per acre sprayed by the drone, all right? Same trial, same date, um, same application timing and everything. 
Let's just focus on this bar graph on the left, which was uh, seven day after treatment visual injury rating. All of the orange bars represents Roundup and a zero tank mix, two way mix. All the blue uh, color bars represents three way mix, Roundup, Reflex, and a zero. Uh, you know, I know we have a non treaty check here. So let's look at this, this uh, comparison first. Roundup Zedra without reflex, Roundup Zedra with reflex. It's a totally expected that when you put a reflex in the tank, you're gonna see a jump in the uh, visual injury, right? So this happened with every single treatment. This comparison happened for every single treatment. So that's not a surprise. So the interesting thing is when you spray with a uh, drone at a two gallon per acre, particularly when you mix uh, reflex and do a three-way mix with, uh, um, uh, with, uh, the, uh, um, with Roundup and Zedra, you can see even though spray drone and two gallon per acre still created about 13% visual injury, but for your ground sprayer at a five, 10 and 15 gallon per acre, we created more than 25% visual injury, all right? So which means lower volume application translated into less crop response here, you know? And then at the 14 days after treatment, this comparison, you know, two gallon per acre versus five, 10, 15, this difference in injury is still there where we sprayed Roundup, Zedra, and Reflex together. The other interesting thing at the 15, at the 14 days after treatment is even where we sprayed Roundup and Zedra without Reflex, the orange bars, look at orange bars. See drone, two gallon per acre, and then this is a ground sprayer at a five gallon per acre. We start to see the difference, uh, you know, uh, widen up. Even, even in the treatment where we didn't spray or didn't mix reflex in the tank. Even for Roundup and a Zedra, we start to see a little bit separation between the five gallon and the two gallon here. So I thought the results are fairly uh, interesting. And I'm sure some folks want to spray uh, foliar herbicides over the top of a corn and soybean. Hopefully this step will get you a little bit more confidence when you spray the burn herbicides. Uh, which never caused much yield loss, but again, they, this could um, um, causing some concern among the growers. All right, pesticide efficacy evaluation. This is interesting stuff. And this stuff, you know, is really easy to understand. So I'm going to go a little faster here. Our first on-farm efficacy test was done in Otago, west of Montgomery. Uh, burn down time, uh, we got a lot of this lovely plant of mare's tail. Um, they were about knee high. Some of those were higher, were taller than knee high, typical size of the uh, burned down wheat. We sprayed a Roundup and a Sharpen at a label rate. We put a half percent interlock in the tank. Uh, that day, I forgot to pack uh, crop oil or methylated seed oil, so that was my bad. With 1% of crop oil and methylated seed oil, Sharpen should have worked even better. All right. So this is how we sprayed. And then this, this side is the untreated side, all right? That's how the weeds look like at the application. This picture shows you how the in-between looks like, untreated and the treated side, all right? Quite a bit of difference. And I was totally surprised to see how clean is the boundary, almost like a knife cut clean. I was not expecting that. This only happened with your boom sprayer or with a backpack boom, you know, because that's where nozzle stops. With spray drone, I wasn't expecting that, but it just happened. Actually, it happened quite a bit in my test on farm. If you look at the uh, uh, treaty side, seems to be pretty decent. You know, the grower was happy to see this. He eventually bought a two T30 himself uh, earlier this fall, I believe. All right, so burn down look good. All right, again, treated versus untreated side. All these little dots, light colored dots represents weeds. All right, I can see weeds fairly well from the sky. This picture was a precision map generated by multispectral farm. You know, Taylor talked about the uh, multispectral drone a little bit. If you guys want to get one, uh, the M3M, which is dirt cheap and play with this so you can examine your efficacy. You can examine where you missed 
uh, and how your application quality was like, this is super easy. I can teach you in about 30 minutes and you can do it yourself, you know. So after we spray, you can see we killed most of the uh, mare's tail versus the non treaty side. I had a little bit striking issue here and uh, there, but that was because I had a three treatments. That was a treatment one, treatment two, and treatment three. I had a little bit overlapping issue in between the treatments, which was uh, which were three different uh, spray operations. If I if I spray this whole area continuously, I should not have the striking problem here. But again, it was fairly good. We killed most of the stuff there. All right, the other test, you can see how thick the uh, pigweed look like in, in, these, uh, in this field section. After spraying Roundup Power Max at Liberty with Interlock and MSO, we still have a bunch of pigweed we didn't kill, which is totally expected. You know, when pigweed gets to six to seven feet tall, nothing will kill them except for uh, a steel blade or fire. You can dump gasoline on them, burn them off. That's a good way to get rid of them. All right. But I also killed a bunch of pigweeds from the top to the bottom. And I create a bunch of bare stems uh, of pigweed on a regular basis. So at a two gallon per acre, this is really not bad. I believe with propeller downdraft, it helped the droplets reach the bottom better uh, than the broom sprayer. All right, this is again uh, of the example of morning glory on top of corn. We got a ton of morning glory down here in the Southeast or in the coastal plain area. And this year, those folks got way too much rain. In July and August, among 60 day period of time, those guys got 52 days of rain. When you have this much rain, there's no way you can do anything out there in the field, all right? So we have seven feet tall cotton plants, six feet tall cotton plants. You don't see it anywhere else just because the grower could not get into the field to spray the PGR, to regulate the cotton and shorten the internode, all right? So that's horrible because six feet tall cotton will not give you much yield. You lose most of the yield because it turns itself into a summer cover crop instead of producing the bulbs, all right? We have some really nice summer cover crop of cotton fields out there this year. All, the, all, all these opportunities for drone operators. Again, before application, morning glory everywhere. Grower couldn't harvest. He called me and said, hey, I know you're always looking for some funky stuff to do, you know, for, uh, for your uh, drone or whatever. You want to spray this? I said, sure, for the sake of research, I'll do it. And then I sprayed a couple acres. This was 10 days later. Grower got blown away by the results. He called his friends, his family, and whatever come here and look, and everybody was impressed. All right, every single thing was dead. That was the same spot. This is the same spot. I took a picture where we launched the drone. All right, even with that much weed, all the grasses were killed by Rana Power Max. Again, I sprayed Rana Power Max aim and a 1% uh, crop oil. I sprayed a 1.5 ounce aim, you know. Don't be cheap, you know, that one and a half ounce aim doesn't cost you a lot of money because it's old chemical, but it will make a difference in the field. Again, I saw this clean cut line again in this test. Where I sprayed versus where I didn't spray. How did this happen? I don't know, it just happened. You know, I don't have a good ex explanation for it, but I know where I quit spraying. And this is the edge of the spray boundary. Everything was dead right here. Everything was still alive and doing pretty good on this side. That just one roll apart from each other. I don't know how this happened, but probably happened for a reason. You know, this side was close to the road, um, by the way. Uh, again, multi-spectral map. Where I sprayed looks pretty good. Where I didn't spray, you can see a lot of this little, you know, uh, lighting uh, or how we call this, you know, little uh, uh, bright dots all over the place uh, represents weeds that were still doing uh, good at that point. Grasshopper control on soybean, you know, sprayed by the drone on this side. This side was his neighbor's field, he didn't spray anything, um, you know, pretty significant difference there. Uh, this year, uh, soybean uh, insects were pretty uh, aggressive because we got too much rain down here. Uh, I have one soybean test where I didn't spray insecticide. Within two weeks, I have zero leaves left on the soybean. Only the uh, bare stems, no leaves, total yield loss. 
All right, that's how much damage these soybean loopers and uh, fall army worms can cause uh, down here. And during those two weeks, raining every day, it was raining every day. The experiment station could not spray anything on time. And guess what? The trial was gone. And if this is a farmer's field, all your soybean yield is gone. So in that specific situation, we're not just talking about save you 12 bucks, 15 bucks per acre. So you don't have to have, uh, you don't have to hire a crop duster. We're talking about saving you 100% yield because you have to spray within that two weeks period of time. You know, there could be several hundred dollars saving per acre because you save your crop. We have a lot of peanuts down here. Um, it's a small crop, but it's a fairly lucrative crop for us down here. We spray five shots of fungicides, fungicides with drone and uh, compared to uh, growers uh, uh, sprayer. He sprayed 15 gallon per acre uh, elsewhere in the field. So after four shots of premium fungicide at two gallon per acre, we saw pretty decent control of leaf spot. That's a leaf spot right there. That's another leaf spot. And I saw no white mold on the ground. White mold is fairly common in the wet here on the ground. So I saw none of white, white mold. This is the area rest of the field sprayed by the grower using his big ground sprayer. Leaf spot, leaf spot, leaf spot, leaf spot. You know, it was everywhere. I didn't see no white mold. So we did both, both of us did a really good job to control white mold. But leaf spot, look at those leaves right there, was uh, was the issue with uh, with the ground sprayer block. If leaf spot gets really worse, it will defoliate your peanut plant. If all the leaves are gone, you cannot expect your yield to be very decent, obviously. So at the end of the year, grower dig both sides, both blocks. And I asked him, did you notice any significant difference between the two blocks? He said, no, absolutely zero. He actually, think, actually, he actually thinks that my block, the drone block was a little bit better because when you dig peanuts, the strength of your wine, the peanut wines are very important. If the wine are weak, you will lose a lot of pots in the soil. He actually thought the peanut wine strength in the drone block was a little better, actually. All right, cotton defoliation. This is a very Southern thing again, because Taylor cannot grow very good cotton in Missouri. He can grow cover crop cotton, cotton you know, just not many bowls. Uh, he doesn't have enough heat units to grow cotton. So this is a pretty Southern thing. In this test, we had airplane sprayed this uh, block, about eight acres. And then we sprayed this too right after plane was gone. Plane said he, he doesn't want to spray two. Minimum, he could go with three. So I say, okay, you can spray three gallon per acre. His swath width was 75 feet. And our swath width was 25 feet for the, uh, for the drone block. Altitude was different. This block, we flew 10 feet off the, off the cot. This, uh, this uh, block, we flew 15 feet off the cot. And then two gallon per acre for the drone. Chemical mixture and rate per acre were exactly the same for airplane and the drone. All right, again, multi-spectral image after we spray. You can see the airplane missed a lot of cotton here and also missed a good old strip right there and then mixed some more here just because people's house People's house close to the highway, lots of telephone poles. Where we have obstacles, and that's usually where the airplanes don't spray really well. That's just a good old truth everybody knows. All right, so he missed a lot of cotton didn't, um, that, that he didn't uh, spray well. With the uh, drone block, uh, we don't have a whole lot of that problem, but I do see striking issue here with this block. And, and with the second treatment block, the striking issue was a little bit better, all right? So why, why, I mean, things happen for a reason. Sometimes I know the reason, sometimes I don't, all right? In this block, we flew 10 feet off the ground. And in the second block, we flew 15 feet off the ground. I believe this additional five feet allowed the cotton drift, uh, not drift, cotton, defoliate uh, defoliant droplets even out a little better with this five feet additional height. I think this is why we saw less streaking with higher altitude. Do I always recommend this? No, because we don't have much wind down here. You know, Without drift concern, I can go a little higher. 
but if wind is pretty significant and you always have wind, you got to be really careful with flying higher because flying higher also means you drift more. All right. How does efficacy look? So this picture will tell you how um, uh, your defoliants work. No doubt airplane work pretty good. This is why people have been using it for 56 years. It gotta be doing a good job if people have been using it for that long, right? Every single cotton was dead, all the leaves were shed off. So that was good. Uh, but where airplane cannot cover will not look good anymore. This is the spot uh, close to people's house. So he just can't spray. And also that's one big old long strip close to the highway he couldn't get too close to because the telephone pool and the wires, you know, no crop duster want to be, uh, you know, hang, uh, no, uh, no, no crop duster want to hit the telephone pool and hang on the uh, telephone wire for a few hours waiting to be rescued. So he cannot get too close to the telephone poles and left a strip undefoliated. All right, this is the uh, second block where we flew a little bit higher, 15 feet and 25 feet swath and the highest operational speed. Again, very comparable to the airplane. This is where we sprayed uh, at a 10 feet altitude. We had a little bit striking issue. Some of the green leaves were still visible on the plant, but really when you stood next to these plots, just look into the field, you couldn't tell any difference if I brought you to the field test. Uh, to, or, or to the testing field. It was just all looking the same from the edge of the field. Efficacy are very comparable. We rated each section or each block 20 times randomly inside each block. Data looks same, no statistical different. No statistical uh, difference here. All three blocks are equal in terms of defoliation efficacy, all right? Sorry, no good news about you guys can beat the airplane and tell your uh, grower that we can spray better than the airplane, but at least you have data to show them that we can do as good a job as airplane on the bigger blocks and uh, close to the obstacles and the people's home and gardens, we can do a bit better job because we can spray on top of those. Uh, airplanes just cannot get too close to the obstacles. The other interesting thing we learned from the cotton defoliation test is when we fly and spray along the crop rows, we saw more streaking issue, more variation. But when we change direction and spray across the crop rows, crop rows go north and south, and when we spray east and west, we actually did not see that much of streaking problem. This is very interesting for defoliants and uh, contact herbicides. I think we're gonna follow up with this lead next year and keep working on it. Again, feel, uh, this is the next section, which I'm gonna go through fairly quickly. Field mapping and spot spraying examples. A lot of people ask, how do I map a field? How can I do spot spraying? You know, what's the software you need and stuff like that. Most of the multispectral image or multispectral map you have seen so far were generated by this setup. I have a Matrice 200 drone, a DJI's Enterprise drone with a Centera 6X camera. This whole set works really good. I have no complaint, but it only costs you about $30,000 in today's market, maybe even more, all right? So do you have to have this setup to do the same thing that I did, uh, you know, like uh, the examples I showed you? Uh, not really, you know, you can talk to Taylor and get a multi-spectral, multi uh, the new M3N, my Mavic 3 uh, multi-spectral for 40 some hundred dollars, you know, as, at a fraction of the cost and you can do the same thing. Uh, yourself at home, right? I do research, so I got to have some better stuff, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, fly time and, 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 uh, and not other categories. But actually, Mavic 3, this is the price I found online. I cannot verify that price, but it's somewhere around $4,000 each, between four to 5000 But just by judging the specification of the Mavic 3, it actually looks better than the 6X in terms of camera resolution. Um, and uh, maybe there's some other things I can't remember exactly, but camera resolution is, is what I care about the most. It doesn't have five band, but it has a four bands that people use the uh, uh, use the uh, most, uh, you know. 
All right, if you don't want to go this fancy, you just want to be dirt cheap, you can get yourself a Air 2, you know, or DJI Air Mini, something like that. It doesn't even cost you $1,000. You can still do field mapping, you know, mapping the boundary, mapping the obstacles at a fairly decent accuracy. Now, I do have to warn you that these cheap drones do not come with RTK. They're not RTK compatible. Uh, Mavic 3 Montes Spectral is RTK compatible. This is why this is what make it RTK compatible, you know, this thing on top of the drone. Um, do you have to have RTK for mapping? Not necessarily, but it's good to have, you know, we don't have RTK mapping drone. And so far we have not hit, the, our spray drone have not hit anything yet. All right, but you do have to leave a decent buffer between the edge of your spray block and to the obstacles. Typically, I recommend minimum 10 feet, 15 feet is better, all right? And don't try to spray underneath the trees. You're not gonna make it happen. So what can you do with the M3M or the multi-spectral drones? I'm throwing out one example. This is a large wheat field, uh, 200 some acres. I flew this one on one Saturday morning in early March, late uh, February, I think. I stood over here uh, around the field edge. I didn't get into the field at all because I don't want to get stuck in there. And, uh, you know, just by looking at the field from the from the roadside, it looks great. It looks really, really good. You know, it looks like a high yielding field. After I did my Martin Spectral flight and stitched all the images together, I was a little surprised to see this field, at least judging from the sky, judging from the uh, 300 feet, it actually looks pretty like a zebra. You know, you see all the zebra uh, lines all over the place in this field. And then I measured the width of the strip, uh, of the streak. It was about 50 feet wide. And I text the grower, I said, how wide you uh, how wide is your fertilizer bu buggy pass? Uh, he replied, 50 feet. And I think that's what happened. You know, his fertilizer buggy doesn't really cover that far. He dropped most of his dry uh, nitrogen or urea, whatever he used, underneath uh, uh, here, you know, and then created a differential growth. You know, red indicates higher, thicker canopy and, uh, you know, blue or green indicates uh, lighter canopy. So that's how he created that problem. And and then if you look at the uh, streaking, it's really, really straight, it really, really straight. So this got to be a GPS cost issue or a GPS guided issue. And then uh, RGB camera, uh, 550 acre cornfield in Talladega County. This guy got a brand new planter being used for the first time and I flew his field. I saw a lot of these happen. Over here, he got a huge hiccup point. I call this hiccup. And then you can see the hiccup, 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 hiccup. All right, the new planter, you know, uh, so it's kind of expected. And then the new planter also doubled the rate of his corn. That's why you see some nice testing plots in, uh, in one pass. And uh, that just kind of confused me a little bit because I texted him first after the flight. I said, did you put in some testing plots in your field? And you know why you have some really high dense population versus the rest of, rest of the field? And then he told me he got a new planter. You know? I thought that was interesting. This is a peanut field. I don't know whose field that is. I just flew this one, Southeast Alabama. Uh, again, a lot of variation there. And the one thing I could tell is this guy used a six row peanut planter how he created this difference with his planter, I don't know, but he seems to double the rate or increase the planting density of the peanut seeds on some of the passes. You know, why did this happen? I have no idea, but I can tell stuff like this really. I bet I got kicked out for some reason. All right, I'm back. A lot of people ask me, can you spot a weed from the sky? Uh, the answer is, yeah, that, that's easy. That's easy. That's a piece of cake, basically. All right, in this example, 
The corn plants are super small. These are basically uh, just like four inch tall corn in that first leaf, the second leaf stage. They're, they're baby corns, you know, um, it's just about this big. And I can see all the weeds in between the corn rows just fine, you know, because for row crops, it's so easy. Anything grain, anything grain growing in between your, your crop rows is not going to be something you want. That's, that's a weed, all right? So spotting the weed is easy. The hard part is, what is that weed right there? I, you know, I can't tell you what a weed is that, or I just know there's a weed there, but I can't, I can't tell you the species. Some people ask me, is there any commercial software or apps I can use to ID the weed? Uh, we're getting there, but we're not there yet. And also, if you want to ID the weed, you can't fly 300 feet like I did here. You're going to have to fly really, really close to the ground. So a artificial intelligence and algorithm can actually actually recognize the weed. So that's going to be difficult for you to cover five or 10,000 or 1,000 acre when you fly that low, you know, so you can only check certain spot instead of cover the whole field for weed ID, you know, just letting you know. And then a spa spray example. This is a cotton field, a hundred some acre cotton field. The distribution of the pigweed uh, is uh, definitely not uniform. Most of the pigweed align along this highway close to this guy's house. All right, I could see that from the sky. This is just a regular RGB camera uh, mounted on a drone. So I drew this spray area quick and dirty and deploy my spray drone and get it sprayed. Take a closer look of the pigweed. This is how you can tell where you have weeds. You don't need any specialized software. Just stitch all of your images together. You can see it just fine. You know, you can see all the pigweed there. Go a little closer, you know, I got one, two, three, four, five, and blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of stuff there. You can see the tiny cotton plants over there, a way bigger pigweed all over the place, all right? So as a quick and dirty uh, practice, I just drew this box and, and uh, export a shape file into the uh, SD card, micro SD card, put it into the controller and sprayed it, all right? How did it work? Oh, uh, this is the, uh, the rest of the field. You know, you can see it's fairly clean. You still have, you know, you can still see a few pigweed. So the growers still have a few pigweeds here and there. But, you know, most of the pigweeds were fairly concentrated along the highway. So that provide the basis for spot spraying. If the weeds is all over the place, you, you might just want to spray the whole field, right? All right, again, I illegally use the Liberty from over the top because for research and demonstration purpose, EPA does give researchers some wiggle room as long as I don't misuse more than 10 acre uh, worth of product. You know, they don't really care what we do. So for research and demonstration, we can, we can do stuff like that. Liberty fried all the pigweeds really, really well from the bottom to the top, from the bottom to the top. You know, again, propeller downdraft. We're using wind to push the droplets down as a carrier. I mean, you can use water as a carrier or you can use the, uh, uh, the wind you know, from the propeller as a carrier as well to compensate the low GPA we use, right? We sprayed a few large pigweeds between knee high to waist high uh, with backpack sprayer. 15 gallon breaker, TT nozzles, medium droplet size, everything follow manufacturer recommendations. You can see we fry the top of pigweeds really good, but all these pigweeds will survive and grow back again because we didn't hit the core, the center of the pigweed, right? There is no velocity, not much velocity of the droplets here. Even though the volume is higher, it does not have the wind from propeller to push everything down. So inside the pigweed is still lush green. We see this every year, every single time, right? That was a quick, dirty example of the spa spray. There are better software coming up. There are multiple software be able to pinpoint the weeds for you automatically. I think a new version of the Smart Farm can do it. Pix40 Fields uh, give grower that option with the latest update. Uh, there's uh, some other software, I forgot the name, Solvi or Sophie, whatever software can do that as well, I think. It, it, it's going to be more and more options down the road, you know, just uh, hang there. Uh, spray drones will be able to do variable rate spot spraying, all of those in the next three years, uh, commercially speaking. All right, current challenges. 
mixing is a headache, particularly at one or two ga uh, gallon per acre. Not all the chemicals can handle volume, spray volume being this low, all right? Sometimes if you don't do jar test, you just think something is gonna work. You're gonna have to deal with some of this uh, cake icing or cheese or a dough, you know, dig those things out from the tank. It can clog your flow meter, it can clog your pump. Uh, whenever this happens, it's not gonna be a fun day and hopefully you can still salvage that pump. Uh, don't have to buy a new one. Got this picture from uh, Alex Bennett uh, from Agri Spray Drill. Uh, these are really nice uh, jar tests. Again, we've been telling people to do jar tests for decades. Many people may not have done more than five jar tests by the time they retire, you know, uh, just nobody do it. Again, uh, Liberty with a list one with uh, this fungicide called uh, Wiltima. Um, typical uh, mix uh, for the corn, I believe. Um, uh, this one was mixed at 15 gallon per acre rate uh, uh, or volume. This one was mixed at two gallon per acre volume. Same rate of chemical, same mix. Two minutes after mixing, we start to notice something funny happened with the two gallon per acre volume, just because the chemical concentration was way higher, seven and a half times higher than the, than the 15 gallon per acre uh, mix. At the five minutes after mixing, we got some really nice jelly, uh, strawberry jelly created in the jar. Hopefully nobody do this in your kitchen uh, because your toddler, you know, young kids may drink this stuff, think it is something funny, you know, or something interesting, right? So this will not work. If the tank mix you make cannot even sustain in a homogenized suspension for five minutes or seven minutes, you can't use it in spray drone because we don't have tank agitation in the, in, in the tank, right? Uh, so they have to be able to sustain suspension for at least seven minutes. So this is not gonna work. And again, a lot of chemicals foam really bad at two, three, four gallon per acre. Liberty is one of it. Some of the dry granule products will have that problem. Forestry products, uh, typically pasture hayfield, there are a bunch of dry formulation that people use. Those stuff kind of foams, you know. So you really need to have a good defoamer to kill those foams and increase your uh, mixing compatibility. We keep a product called Strike Force. It's from um, it's from Nutrien Ag, I believe, from the Nutrient uh, product. So after add, we add a Strike Force into into the um, uh, the foam. You know, it start to kill foam right away, and also increase the mixing compatibility. This is not the only one on the market. We just happen to have a few jugs for free. You know, I typically ask for product, and I take whatever free, right? Uh, so I don't have to buy it. So it worked out good. Uh, Sometimes you have forced landing, you got some other issues, and this drone just fell into a cornfield at the end of the day, you know, broke a propeller, broke the T-bracket, you know, happened quite a bit. Um, so, you know, overheating issues, sometimes a bad ESC and some other things, you know, just be prepared for that kind of stuff. Hopefully forced landing doesn't happen on top of the irrigation pond. So you have to dive into the pond to get that stuff out. That's going to be an ugly day. All right, a bunch of challenges, you know, long FA approval process, they're very behind, um, unfortunately. Uh, spray drift management, management is a big thing, uh, particularly when you spray herbicides and uh, defoliants. Liability insurance can be expensive, particularly if you messed up, they can be very expensive. Uh, battery life is limited, the tank size and flow rate can always get bigger, you know, bigger is better, right? Um, until uh, until some point when the drone gets too heavy, you cannot manipulate it anymore. Uh, visual observer requirement by FAA can add some complexity, which means you're gonna have to more have to hire more people to help you. Uh, mapping new fields can be challenging sometimes. Moving trader can be challenging sometimes. Field shape obstacles, you know, all of those. That's why you have to map the field. And then chemical label for drone is not there. EPA tell us that as long as the pesticide has a air aerial application label for airplane, then uh, drone operators can use them uh, as long as you follow all the recommendations and the requirements in that label, and then your state department ag allow you to use it, then you can use the current aerial application labels. You know, that's, that's what we have. But hopefully we're gonna have some drone labels in future. 
And then many custom applicators have to compete against airplane, helicopter, and ground rigs. That's just going to be part of the life. You got to find your clients. You got to have to find your niche and and be successful. If you don't have your clients, you cannot find enough work to do. Then don't buy the drones in the first place. You know. Technical issue, part availability, lack of training, lack of data, lack of support, those could uh, still be problem uh, here and there. You know, hopefully DJI can keep enough parts flowing to the U.S. because we need a lot of parts in the summer. Um, you know, when everybody using it all day long. Uh, we're gonna keep uh, doing a bunch of research and on farm trials and different studies to continue spray coverage and pattern testing. Um, we may have time, if we have time and money, we can run a spray drift study too, because I do get this amount of questions about how to manage drift uh, with spray drone. Canopy deposition and penetration tests are very important. I plan to run future testing on multiple crops, uh, fruit trees, and uh, vegetables as well. Uh, uh, pesticide uh, PGR defoliant uh, efficacy will continue on farm and also want to focus on variable rate precision application, and spot spraying, this type of newer workflow. All right, that's everything I have. I believe I talk too much, uh, which is a problem I have, have been having for a long time. You know, this talk can literally be separated into two separate talks, um, you know, by by itself. But I, I decided to just cram everything up in, into one talk and, and finish it. All right, that's it from me. Uh, this is my contact information. If you have questions or you want to catch up with me, uh, you're welcome to uh, let me know whether it's by email, text, or, or uh, phone calls. All right, Taylor, back to you. All right, thanks, Steve. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, Steve, that was awesome. Um, I learned I learned a lot a lot there myself. Um, you know, Steve, when it comes to doing research on, you know, herbicides, this is really where we need, um, you know, a lot of data for row crop um, on, on drones, because like you said, herbicides really haven't been done a lot, um, you know, with drones or with any, really a lot of air, any other aerial application too. And this is where they could be really good fit. So I think this is very, very important research. Um, Thank you, sir. I'm going to go ahead and uh, we have one question that came in here from Matt um, on the mm -hmm. comments side uh, asking about the productivity uh, acres per hour advantage over the uh, a T40 versus a T30. Um, I was typing a response, but I'll just go ahead and, and reply right here, Matt. Um, so, you know, obviously, you know, you have a larger tank, you have wider swath um, and you have uh, faster spraying speeds um, with the T40 as well as a couple of different uh, software things. So it really just is gonna depend on your application rate, uh, your field size um, and, and length and things like that. When we look at, you know, like a half mile long square field at a two gallon rate, we're gonna see max efficiency on the T40 of around 40 acres per hour, uh, somewhere around 40 to 45 acres per hour, uh, peak efficiency uh, at a two gallon rate versus the T30s and moving over between 30 and 35. So, um, uh, yeah, probably, you know, 25% increase, I would say. Um, but again, it also depends on your application rate. Now, higher volumes, we're going to see a, a bigger increase from the T30 to the T40. Yeah. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, uh, I'd say go ahead and drop them in here right, right now. Um, if not, of course, you got uh, Steve's contact info. If you want to contact us, um, you can find us at acrospraydrones.com, um, our contact info there. And we'll be down. We'll be down in uh, in Alabama actually uh, this uh, in January. Uh, I believe the seventeenth, eighteenth, nineteenth, um, down in the in Mobile. Um, so we see and Steve there doing lots for the research as well. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I think there are a few questions in the text um, that I read. Uh, what was the flight altitude above the canopy and the GPA used for the corn fungicide study? Uh, 10 feet above the, uh, above the corn canopy at two gallon per acre. Uh, that was the answer. Um, yeah, 25 feet swat on T30, that should be fine. You know, 27 is going to be stretching a little bit. 25 should work just fine. Uh, let's see, there were a little bit of a comment. 
that was that's about the only question I think that's all for me. Taylor, you're muted. There you go. There we go. Uh, were you using the XRO2 nozzles, Steve, whenever um, you guys run in P30? Uh, no, sir. We used uh, air mix a nozzle, which creates a medium droplet size. Uh, a drop in size for us. It's a little bit bigger than the XR, um, but still that gave me fairly good uh, coverage uh, there. Yeah. And probably also reduce your drift that way too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so go back to the uh, altitude question. If you fly a little too high off the corn canopy, you're gonna start to lose the uh, propeller downdraft. Uh, this is something to consider. We do want to blow as much fungicide into the canopy as possible. But you don't want to fly too low either. When you fly too, too low, you're going to reduce your swath width. You know, it won't spray that wide. So it's going to have to be some balance there. Yeah, I think the balance really there is, you know, the balance between efficiency and efficacy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think that's uh, that's that's it for me, Steve. Anything else? No, I think it was awesome. And then um, I appreciate the uh, collaboration <laughs> with uh, your team. Uh, we also have uh, uh, plans to expand in expand the uh, testing into the specialty crops as well. So it's not just going to be, uh, you know, corn, cotton, or soybean. This type of big crops. Uh, we also want to test fruit trees vegetables uh, or ornamentals. Actually, we made a significant progress on the ornamentals uh, in a large nurseries. I think it would be a really good use case for those folks. Uh, so developing new market and new usage is very important. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah that's something that we're, you know, here at Agri Spray Drone, we've actually voted a couple of team members to doing just that um, because we know that, uh, you know, row, row crop, we see the demand already. It's there. We've been using aerial application for decades now. Um, so it's not a new uh, type of application in row crop. It's just a new way of doing it. Um, and so demand is huge for aerial application in row crop. But we know that these, this is a tool that could solve some problems in specialty crops. We just have to have the data to, to show um, and, 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 the, and the parameters, the operation parameters. Um, you know, how do you operate in, you know, on a nursery versus how do you operate in row crop? Those are two completely different animals there. So um, that's something that we're really dedicated to doing. And Steve has been a great resource to help us out there. Thank you. And I believe T40 will be a much better fit for the high volume application. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just because the tank is bigger. And also we're talking about twice more air flowing through the uh, propeller as a downdraft. This is way more powerful than the 30. That you increase canopy penetration. Yeah. We actually have seen uh, uh, potential to do a retrofit on the T40 to um, almost double the output, um, you know, flow per uh, gallons per minute output, something that uh, we might try to look into here um, over the summer. Yeah. That will be good. Yeah. All right. I think now it's just me and Steve just chatting personally, so <laughs> which we could do all day long. <laughs> but uh, I know you guys probably have uh, have places to be. Um, so thanks again for hopping on with us. And again, if you have any questions, well, we're we're open ears. Um, so thanks, Steve, and thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you all. Merry all Christmas, right, you guys. Have a Merry Christmas. <laughs>